Hello and welcome to Imp's WWE Adventures Podcast on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. You can help the network out by leaving us a five-star review. You can also give a donation directly through Red Circle and become one of the amazing community by joining the Social Suplex Discord. Link is in the description. Listen to the other top-notch shows here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Wrestling Art with Chris Sings, Trish and Sarah, Tunnel Talk, and Sam Brown's AEW Match Guide. My name is Matt Mayer, aka Imp, and this is your quick look back at the WWE week that was. 30 minutes of all-in Wembley whiplash as I try to adjust to perfectly fine television. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I've re-watched the entrances on that show, especially the main event, the back-to-back of Daniel Bryan's final countdown, and Swerve's final entrance as champion. Not only is the atmosphere so good, uh, shout out the production up for all-in as well. The production was incredible, especially this, like, the overhead shot of the ramp for Swerve's entrance, the like low down angle capture and cam- Daniel Bryan as he climbs up onto the corner and then leads them into the final countdown. Then later, the way the camera swerves to the S chant, like, the production was, uh, I felt, far superior to All In last year. And the show as well. I felt like last year was this just huge occasion of just getting so many people into the building. But this year, they do what did what WWE do for WrestleMania. We take one of the ends and use that to put on up a huge fancy stage. And I felt like this show felt far superior production wise, even though they had less people. It felt like a huge show, which was a really, really big deal. Really, really enjoyed it. And then you get to WWE and you know, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's absolutely fine. <laughs> absolutely watchable, uh, which is all right. <laughs> There's not really a lot for me to get super excited about. It's the final week bubbling to Berlin. It feels like Berlin's going to be a fun little European show. The crowd are super elevated. It's a really short card. There's not really many matches. It's one of those shows, and it feels like it's going to be it's going to be enjoyable. I'm not expecting anything like massive. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a fun little show. Fans have set the bar, and, and to be fair. Me, as a European person in Europe, I appreciate all these European shows that both companies are doing <laughs> at the moment. I'm not going to complain about getting France, Scotland, then London with Wembley, got Germany over here. Like, all these shows at a normal time. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> My sleep schedule loves it. It feels, it's, it feels great. <laughs> I don't feel tired at all. As an English wrestling fan, I don't feel tired. <laughs> like, I feel normal. That's incredible. That's insane. Anyway, but let's jump on over to Washington, D.C. for Smackers for a very perfectly fine show. <laughs> More in the fine wheelhouse than Raw was, because of course this is the go home from Monday Night Raw, whilst this was previous week smackers. So anyway, let's jump on into it. Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens facing A Town Down under in the main event. Like I'm not, I'm not saying this was bad, but th- but this is the main event where it set in that not getting around to Smackers until after All In was indeed a mistake. <laughs> That's on me, folks. <laughs> That's on me. To, I, to be fair, I left it till Monday, and I was still feeling the buzz from All In, which for me is just like how incredible that show was. Two days later, I was still All In on the buzz of All In. So I delayed watching SmackDown until Tuesday. I, that's it. Still wasn't far away enough from All In. <laughs> I was still feeling it. I've pushed it back. I was just like, I still wasn't feeling it. I still wasn't like, oh, I'm still too hyped for All In. I pushed it back another day and it turns out watching this show, I was still feeling <laughs> hyped about All In. But it really hit with this main event. A perfectly fine main event. But in terms of setting it up, immediately, not a great first note. As if, okay, okay, WWE. I know this aired before All In, but I'm looking for you to just pull me back into your world. Get me happy and invested. Okay, you're starting with uh, Grayson Waller's talk show. It's not a great, <laughs> not a great first note, <laughs> but we can roll with it. We can roll with it. So we had Austin Theory and Grayson Waller opening with a crappy chat show segment for Cody Rhodes. A I skipped school for Cody sign as, ah, yes, the politician's dream uneducated demographic <laughs> showing up for Cody. Cody having none of Waller's attempted wedges, twisting those failed pryings into bringing A-Town down under's inevitable breakup up. A, you can't trust Kevin Owens' VTR play plays, bringing out the man himself. No nonsense KO, just skipping ahead to bringing out Nick Aldis to announce the tag main event. But can he be trusted? Yes, he, yes he can, yes. Which spoils us into the main event. A perfectly fine main event. Showing if Owens can be taken at his word that he's not that guy who turns on everyone anymore. Just, you know, hard to get excited about a main event A town down under. I'm not, like, particularly super invested in it. Kevin Owens, the lad firing off of the hot tag, crossroads to Theory left Owens and Waller. The stunner blocked, but the pop-up power bomb giving us a winning visual for Sunday's title challenger. Owens, after the match, immediately looking over to Cody, teasing it a little more as KO charged with Rhodes' title, just fired up and handing it to the champion. Commentary making sure that we were with Cody in that moment, in momentarily believing he was about to get cracked over the head. 
And sure, this could just be to add a little bit of an interesting kind of nook to it. Is Kevin Owens going to become a, see more of that prize fighter attitude because he's got a prize to fight for? Does it does it just come out of him, or has he genuinely changed? I was saying this last week that I wouldn't mind if this is the beginning of a character arc rather than the standard title match happens, then we move on. It's like, well, what if this is something that does kick the uh, Kevin Owens prize fighter back into gear? And either we don't see it until Berlin or we don't see it until after the Cody stuff and it starts to really kick in and th- losing the title match is something that actually kicks him into a focus. It's not the end of the world to see a character have a kind of a genesis point of, oh, we can directly see what caused this ripple effect there on. Look at AEW right now, the ripple effects caused by Swerve and Hangman months, like a, a year ago, from the promos that they were doing a year ago, from Swerve's actions a year ago. Now the ripples effect have kind of led to where we are right now. You can do a similar genesis point thing <laughs> here, where you have a very clear, oh yes, this is what then started that character to then go on this, either this losing is everything. <laughs> But it still kind of feels like we're in a lull period just trying to generate interesting characters for Cody. So I'm not taking it off the table. that They could just be trying to add intrigue to a match that's otherwise relatively nothing to it. Gunter's going to be the main event. He's the big draw. It almost doesn't really matter what Cody does. He like, gets a challenger. He tries to build a little bit of interest and then he move on. But I know I feel like when I watch WWE, I sometimes feel like they can do more. Like you really felt it watching the Vince stuff, <laughs> like that era. You really felt like you could be doing this better. And I, I'd have so many people just saying, "It's like no, 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 this is good actually." Then the Triple H era comes about, and the reason that you were like, "Well, there's no point in arguing with the people during the Vince era that were saying that stuff was good," because once it changes, they'll be saying, "Oh no, this stuff is good." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's what was, that was my entire point the entire time." <laughs> but it doesn't matter. That's why you don't engage with it. When I watch the Triple H stuff, I still get that feeling of this could be better what helps is as competition so that I'm actively seeing both companies do stuff well and do stuff badly and I think for both of them you could both be better like with WWE there's something about it about the way they make their shows that I'm not able to turn my brain off analytically like I am with AEW there's something about the way they produce their shows where I'm nowhere near as critical as I'm watching it but automatically I just feel like I'm a lot more able to just turn off relax and enjoy it with WWE I can't turn my analysing brain off <laughs> I really can't I really can't I don't know what I don't I don't know what it is about the way they they make their shows, but it just activates that part of my brain. So I'm obviously picking up on something. <laughs> Maybe need to look at it. Basically, what I'm it's a bit of a roundabout way. What I'm saying is, when I watch this Kevin Owens, Cody Rhodes stuff, there's a very strong chance that they're just trying to build some interest for the pay per view when it doesn't really matter. But I look at that and I think, but you could use this to actually do something though. Like you don't have to just... That's what the Vince problem was. It would be like a short little build and there was a kind of jokey thing of, well, let's see if this matters after four weeks. With this Kevin Owens stuff, I would like everything that's happening here to matter after four weeks. Under the Triple H reign, that's not been a question that's been being asked just because there's far more competency in the writing. And now you're seeing it a lot on Raw. They are introducing things from the past to almost hindsight, but into the now. It's like, oh, this is happening now because of this thing. It's like, oh... You know what, I appreciate them actually looking into the past to try and create stuff for now to make it feel like it fits some form of character or narrative or something. And maybe that's just because the Cody Rhodes reign so far hasn't had that oomph to it in terms of who he's facing. He still feels incredibly over. Like, in spite of his feuds just being not that much or not really hitting, it's not Cody's fault. He is a champion and a character. Feels like he's at just a great point. He is a champion character, hasn't really evolved anywhere, but that's more because... The challenge, you haven't really got the challenges to allow that to happen. And with this hand-picked challenger here with Kevin Owens, you can do something. Cody is a champion picking him, and then what it does to Kevin Owens afterwards, yeah, that's an actual, that's an actually interesting thing, because of what that does the next time Cody thinks about choosing somebody or choosing a friend. That like it actually adds substance and weight to the decisions. <laughs> things. You've added consequences to losing. But yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Let's move on to the United States Championship. LA Knight versus Santos Escobar. A perfectly fine little telly match. Why just call this the perfectly fine week? <laughs> I was just like, it was the perfectly fine week of WWE. LA Knight is already so over as US champion. Cheeky Del Ventasma beating before the bell. All of them ejected, but the damage was done. Early doors, Barrett on commentary, painting the world where Escobar trading ringside help for an early upper hand was possibly a mistake. And Outs Table teasing as the actual most over entity, Tables, gets their chant. Escobar the ultimate heel, his double knees not giving the crowd their coveted table break, instead just a flat backdrop onto it and an oof. 
Big pop for Knight's pop-up elbow and BFT for the win. A great platform for the champion, but also agree that there was no need to try and prop this up to try and get it on Berlin. After the ad break, Escobar, an angry faction leader, taking it up on his crew for getting ejected from ringside. Speaking of crews, they then set up sailing with Corbin Cruz. Who are oh, sail the seas. <laughs> I'm assuming that's happening next week. Then later on, LA Knight issued an open challenge for Deutschland. So, oh, that's why this wasn't on the burning card. Like, LA Knight is getting on the burning card. They do want to continue his over momentum and get him onto the show. But it's not going to be Escobar. It's going to be an open challenge. It's like, oh, you can, you can do something interesting there. The other title match was the WWE Tag Team Championships. The Bloodline versus the Street Profits. Solo Sokoa's promo first, the bloodline back to full strength for this first Romanless smacker since the slams of summer, the fans' refusal to acknowledge Solo displayed and reinforced front and centre here, so WWE can claim that they're the ones that manipulated it. Fatu hands his title over to Tangaloa, with Solo just telling him, like, you can't be tag champion if you're going to be my own personal enforcer. And a lot about of tonight with terms of Fatu was about showing his blind loyalty to Solo. The Gorillas actually the ones to defend the titles, with Loa now getting You Can't Wrestle chance. <laughs> I've, I've watched this man for years in New Japan, and it generally wasn't until his singles run in the G1 Climax where I pulled a hoof <laughs> kind of face. <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't know what's happened. I watched him for years be a perfectly fine, capable tag team wrestler. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> Maybe just, I don't know, finding some form of groove or something will just help him. Uh, yeah, whatever's happened, like, as I, I know he's a better than this. <laughs> so I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> I don't know what's got him a rock or whatever. In terms of this match, Ford flying high over the corner to the outside, taking out lower, signalled the interference, solo up onto the apron, Fatu super kicking as the difference maker, and into the ring for Tamatonga to snatch the win. Beat down after the match called for DIY's interference. A hilarious groggy selling from Solo as the lads amps up to not hit their finisher because of Fatu jumping in. Instead, flowing into Sakura, spiking them both with their troubles. I was in a bit of a, oh, reaction to this when I was just like, oh, so DIY lost the final. They've run out of attack here and then this is maybe setting up a future match. So it's almost like the final didn't really matter. They're both going to get a shot anyway. <laughs> Which is like a bit of a... When it comes to tournaments in a WWE... I guess it sometimes happens at AEW as well. Where you go through such an arduous tournament. But then once the tournament's over and you're a crowned contender... Then the next person just has to walk out and they get the match. <laughs> it's one of those vesting logic things where you normally just forgive it and turn your brain off and be like, ah, whatever. Because there's not really a way around that. You can't both do a tournament and do the that kind of setup. And it totally makes sense, but it's just kind of accepted in wrestling. <laughs> That's just how it works. Every now and then someone on Twitter will pack up about it. Uh, nowadays, normally in bad faith for whichever show they don't like. But it still, it still makes me laugh uh, whenever I notice it. <laughs> whenever my brain <laughs> just goes, wait a second, <laughs> wait a second. And that very quickly brings us on to the other notes, which are very short this week, as I realised just not a lot to talk about from SmackDown. Blair Devonport teamed with the Women's Tag Team Champions to lose to the Bel Air, Cargill and Naomi Super Team. Uh, side note, Bel Air's US Olympic team inspired gear was bloody great. We also got a wee little video with Canadian Natalia explaining modern day Germany to the American audience. Well, through a raw taping from the 90s in Germany. But that's closer than most point of reference, I surmise. <laughs> it's like, actually, Germany's like this now. Well, thank you, Natalia. It was a perfectly fine SmackDown, just in the middle of a build towards a pay-per-view. This, it's been, for me, that's kind of been the build since SummerSlam. Like, it's technically, no show has been, like, a bad show. SmackDown is by far the one which is way easier just to get through. Uh, Raw's still got massive pacing issues, and I've noticed, as of the last few months, a few production, I'll call them faux pas, that I thought had faded away under Vince has started to creep in a bit. Like, in terms of, like, the show structure and returning from an ad break to then do something entirely different that wasn't the match that you were talking about, where we'd had a long stretch of returning with long shots from an ad break, we still get those every now and then, but instead we're getting return... Then we get like a backstage segment or an interview or a promo for something else while the person's just waiting in the ring <laughs> for ages because they came out before the ad break. It's like, oh, this stuff that I thought we might have moved on from is now plaguing the shows again. So I don't know what's happening. I don't know if that's just based off of realising. I do have to remember that in America, people do actually switch the channels during an ad break. But is the way that they bring them back like they can't just do immediately into the match? Are those people not come back like that? Is that how it... I'm wondering what they're basing that off of. Like, why have they changed that? 
Maybe just listen to Trish and Sarah. <laughs> this is their wheelhouse. <laughs> I'm stepping on Trish's toes <laughs> with uh, going, what's Horish about? It? Anyway, let's jump on over to Monday Night Raw. Was Raw also just perfectly fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Let's jump on over. Let's jump on over. The new Judgment Day opened the show with a promo out in the ring for the first time since they've gone into their new form. Everybody getting a line, but aside from Carlito, I'd forgotten what they said as soon as they said it. <laughs> like, Dom got his booze, pretty much just reiterating the same lines we've already heard, but adding that he's entering the IC tournament. Boyaka Boyaka, Latino World Order out for, father to have a word with his son. At least when you were with Rhea, one of you had a set, and it certainly wasn't you. Oh, goes the crowd. All pops off into a tag match ad break lead-in. LWO versus Judgment Day. Dragon Lee! Oh, I remember Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee sure can dive and Joaquin Wilde sure can fly. As I've seen that spot three times now and every single time it's great. <laughs> it's where he just gets flung <laughs> off of the uh, second rope. We've not seen much of LWO outside of the quick, like, I call it death slot nothing. But also, Rey Mysterio has had seemingly quite extensive stem cell surgery. So to see him get more of that treatment and then just, each time he comes back, it's, it's just like he's like five years long, younger. Science is insane. <laughs> science is crazy. I mean, the, the word science literally just means knowledge. So knowledge is crazy. It, it sounds nerdier when you say that. <laughs> it sounds so nerdy. <laughs> Maybe because of that outside circumstances, there just hasn't really been much consistency in the presentation of the LWO since getting drafted in Monday Night Raw. So, like, just seeing them here in this spot, it was just, it was just nice. This Go Home Raw didn't really do anything for me in terms of the stories that I've already covered on past weeks. But all the other stories I've not really dedicated any time to. I felt like this was a quite a decent show. Like, not the best show that's getting you hyped for Berlin, but a pretty decent show in terms of building their other worlds and other things. It's actually, even though it's a go-home for Berlin, this was a show for building up all, a lot of side characters we've not really got much time dedicated to. Or if not time dedicated to, it was more where on the show they got the time dedicated to. We had certain streaks broken this week to a great cheer from me. <laughs> it was like, that's a finally. In this match, Ray getting the best of Dom, but Liv pulled him out of the way of the frog splash. Quick roll-up for the win as Morgan's involvement is emphasised hard on commentary. After the match, the announce table cleared by Finn for Ray to get slammed through. Dom climbing onto the ring post. Uh, they're teasing a frog splash, but I don't know if Dom can make that. <laughs> but my this is my brutality. Booms out of the Titan Tron to save him. Like, oh, Dom is on there going, thank God, I'm about to have to try that jump. <laughs> he can climb back down now. Priest and Ripley getting the visual of beating up Dom and Liv until the others make the save. So instead we get the visual of a message sent through the two lesser characters, South of Heaven and Riptide to JD and Carlito in duality. But I'll start with this one, just because I've, since SummerSlam, I've not really gone much into this, really. I've talked about the segments and whatever, but I've not really gone that much into it. It feels like like it's good to have moved somewhere. Uh, last week I was joking that the, the name of the Terror Twins felt incredibly corny for a duo which should be far away from corn <laughs> as possible. As far away. Like they're allergic. <laughs> Keep them far away from that stuff. WWE, there's a lot of branding tied into the characters and it felt like this is a kind of group that should be purposefully kind of just kept away just because of how perspective-wise that can impede on a character. The way that they can look at a character kind of through the branding lens. Like with Cody Rhodes, that's absolutely fine. With these two, the whole Terror Twins branding and then I'm assuming like designs and certain shirts that are going to be coming out for it, if it doesn't feel... The vibes that they're going for doesn't really feel like something that they should be leaning into. They're not that kind of acts, which I guess is a downside of a lot of, I guess, acts conforming to a certain way and a way to filter and follow them through. It just means that, yeah, they're going to get conflated a little bit. <laughs> it's like, oh, this act could be really interesting and really cool. Not into the Terra Twins branding. <laughs> not into whatever they're doing there, whatever they're leaning into. But, you know, WWE, you got to come up with something. Sometimes it's just it's not great. <laughs> that said... Mark Briscoe has been able to win me over with the conglomerate. <laughs> so if he... I mean, Mark Briscoe, he's something else. <laughs> and him just saying the word conglomerate <laughs> is, is, is worth it every time. If he's able to win me over with that, that there's proof that he can have a uh, uh, name and still win me over in time with the way that you can build around it. It just, feel, it just feels like this kind of act which should be, by just mean in terms of presentation, you purposely have them not lean into it like this. There's a way to build up merchandise without having to funnel it through like this. 
<laughs> with a really strong branding or whatever. And that, that, that said, I don't think any of it really matters. We're in a current WWE era where everything is over. They can't really do any wrong. It, it just screams like, even though they're doing really well, they could be doing even better. <laughs> when I look at this and I'm just like, brand them differently. You don't do the Terra Twins presentation like this with Cole being the one pulling it through. And there's a much better way because this should feel like a non-corporate team to a T and this branding corporate to them a little bit. It's just in with that branding and the fact that it's Cole that's heavy-handedly delivering it each week to make sure that we know these are the, the Terra Twins, this is their branding. But it doesn't feel like this group should be that. They shouldn't be through a corporate funnel. <laughs> you do that with other groups, but, but, but maybe not this one specific one. <laughs> Long story, it doesn't really matter. Short story. It would be nice, though. It would be nice. Moving on to the Intercontinental Championship tournament we started. Uh, sorry, I'll give it its full title. The Intercontinental Championship number one contenders tournament triple threat qualifying matches. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's more than a line long. Jay Uso versus Kofi Kingston versus Karrion Cross and Xavier Woods versus The Miz versus Pete Dunne. You look at this and go, oh, you could have some really fun triple threats there. But then they are like middle of the show, perfectly fine TV triple threats. So you're never going to go that crazy. I did appreciate that they the flow of both was different because my absolute least favourite f- flow is two lads fighting as one lays ringside waiting for a swap and then you just swap in and rotate out. It's my least (laughs) favourite. My absolute least favourite. You're basically watching a series of singles matches. like. (sighs) But my absolute favourite triple threat is where all three of them are in the ring and doing different stuff. We got more of that in the second match. So the two triple threats felt distinctively different. That still meant I had to sit through the first one. So the first one was Jey Uso, Kofi and Karrion Cross. A match where it's the guy who's still incredibly over facing two lads locked in a forever feud. Sometimes the writing is on the wall in huge emphasised capital letters. <laughs> Jay Uso, <laughs> he's winning. The goodies worked together a tad, but that didn't last long, which then sent us into my least favourite flow of one in, one out tagging. Plenty of yeet with the other two lads snapping in. Uso splashing down onto Cross for the win in the end. Then we move on to Xavier Woods versus The Miz versus Pete Dunne. This one with a longer period of all three in the ring. There we go, that's the stuff. So automatically became my preferred three-man of the two. Even if it did have The Miz becoming a high-flyer babyface. <laughs> it's like, oh, we've lost Ricochet, don't worry. We've still got The Miz. <laughs> still got The Miz, he can fill that void. Woods flying with his springboard elbow, but Dunn pulled the referee out before the three. The villain, the Birmingham baddie, stealing his way in and hitting the bitter end for the win. Not a massive pop, as the crowd aren't invested in the Bruiserweight character yet. This version of the Bruiserweight certainly isn't taken as a serious threat yet. That butch stank is strong and lingers. <laughs> uh, just in terms of presentation as well, they didn't really get the crowd behind whatever their... New, was it New Catch Republic? <laughs> they didn't really get the crowd behind them massively. They appreciated the performers, but as an actual act, you could kind of sense it. They weren't massively behind them. They drafted to Raw, don't really get any momentum. Tyler Bake gets injured. Then Pete Stone gets injected into this shameless stuff, and it felt like actually something, using the background to actually inject it somewhere. But the crowd didn't feel like they wanted to boot to Pete Dunne, and it's very quickly turned into where they don't really know how they want to respond to Pete Dunne. It'll get there eventually. I'm a bit worried they might see this and have a bit of a Bonson Reed panic of, oh, well, this hasn't worked, we'll wait a bit and try something else. I feel like if they keep going this direction and have Pete Dunne wrestling like he is, the crowds will automatically turn on him in a good way, <laughs> which is what you want. <laughs> you want him to become that villainous character. You just need to actually give them reasons, and that's what they've been doing with Bonson Reed. It's a lesson for the Bonson Reed thing. With the, you can apply that to Pete Dunne immediately. Just visually give them reasons to boo, especially for a WWE audience, which has been conditioned to be like, the story and the things you're told about the characters happen outside of the wrestling. You need to give segments like that for them to get invested into it. That's not me saying that's how wrestling should be, because as I'm saying, uh, there's a reason AEW caters to me more. The wrestling and the story should never be separate. <laughs> they feed into each other, and it's the WWE crowd that seemingly don't know they're being told a story through the wrestling. I think, I think I'm going to say, surely that's a small percentage, like a small Twitter percentage of the actual fans. Most fans know they're being told a story in the wrestling ring. They're not stupid, but, you know, there's a selection who are stupid. <laughs> it's a selection. Yeah. I'm not going to rule that out. <laughs> it's like, no, no, there are stupid fans, though. <laughs> they, they definitely exist. <laughs> 
definitely. I mean, you've been to a wrestling show, right? You've sat near them. As even I, as I wasn't at all in this year, but I did hear a story of somebody uh, when the Young Bucks joined their match. They were just saying that, oh, like, oh this is why the Young Bucks have uh, never drawn anything. It's like whilst they're at all in, <laughs> like you can't make this shit up. <laughs> Cannot make this shit up. <laughs> like you do know the history of the event, though, or even just anything about the event that you are currently sat at, right? <laughs> That's just like next level. <laughs> You're gonna have some kind of incredible dead brain <laughs> to, to to say that whilst at all in. <laughs> it's incredible. Anyway, yeah, the fans all, if, as long as they are given reasons to do for Dunn. Uh, the point I was making was he's doing all this stuff in the ring, he's not really getting massive reactions, but you have kind of conditioned your audience to react to big character beats being important outside of the matches, which is the re- reconditioning AW's kind of done for their audience. Their audience reacts massively to what's happening in the ring. Whilst in WWE, they've been conditioned for the biggest beats to not happen in the match. There's asterisks for that. Main event of WrestleMania, they'll pay attention to that stuff. And when it comes to like weekly TV, they've, they've been conditioned for it to appear elsewhere. I'm not saying you can't do it in the match, but for some reason it won't be interpreted as important if you don't do it outside of the match. So Pete Dundas needs more outside the match stuff. What they're doing wants to read right now with the parking lot stuff this week, which I'll get to in a second. Like that. That was actually a jump to that right now, actually. Kudos to them, Bronson Reed versus Braun Strowman. I honestly walked into this show expecting this to be in the other notes, but nope, they went out there and they did something entirely different for the Aussie. Two big beefy boys battling backstage and smashing the roof of a poor lad's car, starting out in the ring with a Strowman dropkick of all things, and escalating as the two huge men just beat the hell out of each other, walk and brawling out to the parking lot. First, Strowman chokeslamming Reed onto the bonnet, then pouncing the man onto another car. Bronson climbing up onto a wall behind them and Tsunami splashing onto a car roof draped Strowman. Can't feel my hands or something, he says. Uh, I think no, he said fingers. Like, oh, I didn't just realise for the branding, he really should have said hands. <laughs> he should have said hands. And also because it's WWE, of course the car was rigged with a little pfft spark. The side windows were big well though, like I'm not going to complain about that. Uh, them all smashing upon the Aussie's impact looked great, but you know, the little pfft and spark was, yeah, your classic funny WWE additional emphasizer. That's just not needed. <laughs> That's been a while. Like when somebody would get drip, when they first introduced like the electronic ring post of things and they'd get somebody charged into the ring post and they'd have like a fuzz appear on it. It's like, what's caused the fuzz? <laughs> like, like no. <laughs> well, they just to really emphasise the big thing that's happened is when they get charged through anything electronic, just sparks everywhere, <laughs> huge explosive. And the main event was Uncle Howdy versus Chad Gable. Like, I know the spooky shit isn't for everybody, but I've been pretty high on the way that they've been presenting this group since the debut. The, the debut, I felt like maybe tread into lanes. I wasn't too. It's not the kind of wrestling that I'm massively into. However, I did think since then they've done a much, much better job. And I still think the same here. They've kind of nailed the route ever since. The in-ring debut for the Howdy character, a really important night for proving how the workings of this act operate. Also, Chad Gable in a main event is now normal. So in a way, we're all winning. If you don't like the spooky shit, you got main event Chad Gable. like, <laughs> and, it's, and it's normal. All the lads there, but all Uncle was the only one who lantern walked down to the ring, Bo purposefully wrestling like his brother, echoing that style off the bat before swinging their own way, brawling ringside during the ad break before returning with an angle slam onto the announce table. These Wyatts aren't invincible horror movie monsters, more driven with purpose by Bray's memory than receiving spooky superpowers because of it. And I'm appreciative of that. <laughs> Much prefer this. The ref down and the mandible claw called out the Creed brothers. Their ringside punches just met with laughter from Bo. Because yeah, of course the other Wyatts are just going to jump about and make a surprise attack from the front. In terms of like surprise attacks from the front, <laughs> it's because it's off camera. It's your essentially your movie logic. <laughs> it's like, well, I, the audience, didn't see it coming because I obviously can't see it off camera. But it's not going to be. There was a Swerve match in NXT. I can't remember. I want to say Swerve sounds like Swerve. I don't know if that's true or not. But Swerve match in NXT, which had a surprise attack from the front via a digger. Like a big JML <laughs> forklift. <laughs> it was a big forklift thing. And I was just like, that's the, by far the absolute, the silliest attack from the front surprise. Because <laughs> it's like, how do you surprise attack from the front driving a digger in? <laughs> I always love it. It's hilarious. All brawling away before the focus returned to the ring for Gable to miss his moonsault and for Howdy to sister Abigail for the win. 
this wire act continues to be incredibly over. The spooky stuff may not be for Gunter, but it certainly does have an audience that loves it. Just listen to the responses when this act is in the ring, or doing anything, they are so behind them. And I feel like it's leaning into the Bray stuff just enough to have the echoes of him, which, again, when I talk about the style of Bo, there was a lot of Bray mannerisms within the first couple of minutes, and then you start to get a few more unique things. Obviously, the ending as well. You've got the Mandible Claw, you've got the Sister Abigail. It was more like the way he was doing it, the way he was moving. I felt Bray at the start, and then more Bo as the match went on. Which is good, in a way. It feels like this act should be echoes of the Bray and the spooky stuff but then also just injecting the new kind of way that they're going to be doing this group. And I'm not going to say that I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of it, but for the audience that likes this, I feel like this is a much more digestible version than what we got via, like, The Fiend with the actual superpowers and the, <laughs> the actual stuff. Well, here this feels... The phrase that was used beforehand was, this is going to be a more grounded version. And my immediate reaction was, I mean... But technically it's not we're not getting teleportation we're not getting fireballs <laughs> we're not getting mind control <laughs> it's like you know what this is more grounded than that but you would still put it within that supernatural kind of sense whilst ever since then there hasn't really been anything supernatural apart from i guess whenever they come out fog emits but that you know it happens quite a bit in wrestling <laughs> but it's still it's less su it's spooky with the less of the supernatural part i personally appreciate that because that makes it way easier to digest within the wrestling landscape it's like what well, is if this guy's got teleportation powers and he's got fireball powers why doesn't he just dot 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 <laughs> like you're not asking any of those questions because they don't have the ability to mind control or teleport <laughs> they don't have those powers but anyway yes I, I thought it was a great main event debut for the uncle howdy character the actual name of uncle howdy is like yeah <laughs> it feels a little bit cartoony uh, I'm not from a swamp, so I don't know. <laughs> Moving on to the other notes. A positive other note for Damage Control, as Damage Control's Sky Pirates faced the Gillette Fusion Collection. Can't remember their actual name, but they did sound like a shaving brand, so let's just go full in. <laughs> let's go 100% in. Not in the death slot before the main event. I swear, it's been weeks. Good for them. This is what I was talking about last week, in terms of the show is telling you that this isn't important. The slot that they put them in here didn't tell you that. I was like, no, no, that mostly wasn't there this year, this week, which means a lot. Drew McIntyre finds himself in the other notes. He sends us home for Berlin. It, it feels wild putting this in the other notes, but I really don't have anything new to say on this from what was said last week. Like the promo was fine, but we've just we've been here for a while. This is we're at the same point we were the night after SummerSlam. We've got the oh, that's not quite true. We've had the strap match announced. But it feels like because they tried to do a course correct or an over explanation on how mementos work to, for the bracelet, then that, no, that wasn't the issue. The, the booking of the match just made CM Punk look stupid. That's about it. <laughs> it's not, uh, you don't have to overreact to, oh, like, oh, we did this over a bracelet. Yeah, you don't, uh, you don't have to explain the importance of the bracelet. We understand. <laughs> That's not what the issue is here. But CM Punk came out just to give us the tease of seeing Drew getting whipped. Cole calling shades of what it's going to look like on Saturday cool <laughs> not anything more to say also the same with Vandy Orton and Gunter nothing new to add for this in terms of what I said last week Vandy Orton took his time to sign a sign for a kid but he didn't rush the rest of his entrance because of it like he's Vandy Orton of course he doesn't does he look like Ricochet <laughs> absolutely not I mean Cole had plugs to get through as the man posed anyway so you know might as well just take as long as you want so Paul, uh, Cole can get through even more <laughs> plugs yeah, but that brings me to the end of the show a perfectly fine <laughs> showing from wwe allowing me mental space to get really to get excited for all in and then to be excited for days after i'd watched it to just keep that buzz about and then watching when i'm watching smackdown to realize i'm still feeling buzzed it's like you know what no i'm gonna i'm gonna watch the entrance again i'm gonna i'm gonna watch the the uh i'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the gauntlet again <laughs> i'm gonna do it again the pop from nigel mcginnis coming out to the o oasis beat like oh yeah i'm gonna watch that again <laughs> it's so incredible <laughs> Yeah, it was, for me, All In was a magical show. Uh, that's my WWE review. My WWE thing is, w, this week was perfectly fine, but All In, oh, wasn't that a magical show? <laughs> wasn't that magic? I am expecting Berlin to be... I don't think I don't know if it will be on the France levels because of how special that show was, but I'm still expecting a great crowd with a great atmosphere. The, them getting Gunter's going to feel really special. There's a lot of positives going in here that I'm genuinely quite looking forward to it. Also, not counting out the fact that it's going to be airing at a decent time. It's like, another win for me. <laughs> another win for me. <laughs> also, for you Americans in the middle of the day of a Sunday, I've heard some people really like it because it means they're not going to bed at midnight on a Sunday, about the day before work. 
But I don't know, like, with other people who do things like go out outside the house, is it a bit more of a problem? <laughs> the people we know got friends and actually, like, organised to do things. <laughs> for you people, it's maybe not the best to have a show start at 1pm. <laughs> but, you know, for wrestling fan nerds on the internet, oh, oh, <laughs> it's a dream. <laughs> it's a dream. Anyway, perfectly fine week for WWE. To a point where I can crack jokes about uh, AEW still being on the brain. <laughs> uh, but we'll switch gears to Berlin. New cycle to move on, even if my a week later my brain still hasn't moved on. <laughs> my uh, fight subscription is going to get so worn out watching the uh, <laughs> watching the replays for the All In stuff. I'm going to know those time codes off by heart. <laughs> Immediately where to skip to for like what are the best parts of the show. <laughs> I can sense it already. Anyway, with that I say thank you for listening, liking, engaging in any form, any manner. Always appreciated, never take it for granted. I'll be back this time next week to talk about the bash in Berlin and Bullet Night Raw. So with that... I bid you adieu. Adios.